So what I wanted to start with in this public lecture is really an overview of what do we know about the origin of the universe how, and how do we go about understanding what the universe looked like when it was much, much less than a second old. Um, so, thank you. Um, so I thought I would start with having a look at um, just a very brief overview of how is it that we study the universe. Um, not assuming that any of you are physicists or astrophysicists, um, really just talking about from, from the general perspective of what are our tools for trying to understand what happened a very, very long time ago. And then as we go through that a little bit, we'll start talking about what are some of the things that we've learned um, as, we've, as we've gotten into that. So our primary tool for understanding the universe is light. Um, light is a something that we don't think about every day. Um, we see it, we use it to see other things, but we don't typically spend a lot of time thinking about the fact that light travel time is, is finite. So light travels at a finite speed, and for that reason, we can study the distant universe. And it's kind of a remarkable thing that if that were not true, we would have almost no tools to do this. Um, it travels very, very, very quickly, so we don't think about it. I mean, if we sent light around to travel around the world, it could go all the way around the world about seven and a half times in a second. So for our purposes, you sitting in the back of the room see me as I am now, not as I was some time ago. Um, but in fact, it is taking some time for the light that's bouncing off me to reach you. There is one other tool that we have just developed to study the universe that is very, very different from light. It is, it is as though we just developed ears. Um, and this is in the form of something called gravitational waves. And I will say a few words about that. But I want to go back first and talk about what we can do with light. Because for the history of astronomy, light is the only tool we have had to understand what's happening in the universe. So if you think about light, um, light travel time as a measure of distance, you can write down a very simple equation, and I promise there will not be many equations, but the time is equal to the distance divided by the speed of light, which is a constant. So you can always compute something that you refer to as a light distance, a light second, a light minute, a light month, a light year. Um, if you look at light coming from a distant mountain, something like 10 kilometers away, it takes about 33 microseconds for that light to get to you. That doesn't really change your perception of what's going on with that mountain. But if you look further away, if you look at our moon, you see it as it was about a second, just over a second ago. If you look at our sun, you see it as it was eight minutes ago, and so on. And that actually starts to give you a little bit of a picture of what I'm talking about, because if the sun were to implode and disappear, we would not know about this for eight whole minutes. We would have no information. It could be gone. It could have gone away before I stood up here, and we wouldn't know. That's kind of interesting. Um, but the universe is really big, so a light year from Star Wars or Star Trek or wherever people have heard that term is the amount of time a light takes to travel in a year. And if you think about the kind of scales that we deal with in astronomy, a typical galaxy like our Milky Way where we live um, is about a hundred, uh, has a hundred, about a hundred billion stars. And the closest star, the very closest one is about four light years away. Um, which gives you a little bit of an insight into the kinds of questions sometimes I pose for my undergraduates when we say, well, have, have aliens landed on this planet? Um, possibly. Certainly there's life out there somewhere. But if you think about how far they would have had to come and how long it would take to come and do nefarious things in your backyard, it, it raises some doubts. Um, not that it could never happen, but you know, are they going to live in the nearest star four light years away, which would take by any normal means of transportation hundreds or thousands of years to get there. Um, but the diameter of our galaxy is about 100,000 light years. So we see the stars in our own galaxy as they were when Homo sapiens first appeared on Earth. So even looking at the things that are closest to us, not big exotic things out in the universe, but just ordinary regular old stars sitting right here in our own galaxy, we're already looking back in time um, up to 100,000 100, years or more. 
Um, so you can think of this as understanding, if you look at stars, if you assume that the distribution of stars within our galaxy is not all of that, all that inhomogeneous, if you look at stars that are maybe only 1,000 light years away and stars that are more like 10,000 or 100,000 light years away, right here within our own galaxy, we have a way of probing the history of the stellar activity and the planetary activity in our own galaxy. But it goes much, much further than that. Um, our Milky Way, the gal our galaxy is called the Milky Way, it's part of a local group of galaxies and it's thought to be a very typical group of galaxies, nothing special about where we live. And this local group contains three large galaxies, the Milky Way, our own, um, one called Andromeda and, and um, one more typically referred to as M33. This, the one shown here, this is the Andromeda galaxy. It's about two million light years away. And this is our closest, thank you, big neighbor. Um, so anything we see in the Andromeda galaxy shows up um, about when the first proto-humans were appearing on Earth. And that's, that's our closest neighbor. So remember that there's no way you can get information about that galaxy that's less than two million years old. It's kind of an interesting thought when you think about looking out into the universe. Everything you see, you're seeing as it was a really, really long time ago. Or you can think of the light that's landing in your camera has been traveling for millions of years until it crashes into your detector and terminates. That's also kind of sad. Um, the, the Coma Cluster is the nearest supermassive galaxy cluster. It has about 10 to the 15 solar masses. That's kind of a number that won't make any sense unless you're a physicist or a scientist, but it's about a thousand trillion suns. Um, and the distance to that nearest cluster is about 340 million light years. So we observe things in this cluster as they were um, about um, 100 million years before dinosaurs appeared on Earth. And that's our nearest neighbor cluster. And I promise not to do this zoom out forever, this is the last one, but the, if you think about the way that structure is distributed on the very largest scales, if you look at a very small box of what the kind of structure looks like on the largest scales, what you see is this filamentary kind of structure. And one of these enormous large clusters that I've been talking about would live right in, you could barely see it, in one of these teeny little knots in this, in this big, dense filamentary structure. Um, so what I want to do quickly is show you this really great animation that was put together from a bunch of work that was done at Princeton largely, but with a lot of collaborating institutions. You're going to see a little animation that shows a zoom out, so you'll start to see data. Every single image you see here is real data, and you're going to see, as, you're going to see images as you go further and further and further away from, whoops, from us. There it goes. Every single, oh, the light, we should probably bring the, brought the light down, but that's right. Can you see it okay? Um, every single one of those is an actual galaxy that's been observed. And as you'll see, as you get further and further and further away, you can start to see that filamentary structure. And then in a minute, you'll start to see that there are actually, it looks like sprays of filamentary structure. That just happens to be the place where we had observational time to see that. So you're, we're just starting to fill out our picture of what the universe looks like on the very largest scales. And we have, very, we have a nice slice, several nice slices that go pretty far back, but we don't have um, a complete representation. These are the furthest away things, typically quasars, and then out in the very farthest away, you see this funny modeled structure. That is what's called the cosmic microwave background. And this is our entire observable universe. So we have actually observed, out looking out in every, every direction all over the sky, we have observed in the cosmic microwave background, we have a complete picture of our observable universe. And closer in, we have only a partial picture of our observable universe. But that's it. That's our whole observable universe. And by observable, I mean we can, we can see light that was emitted as far back as, as light was emitted in the history of the universe. We can see the first light that was emitted and has been traveling for the last 380 billion years. 
So I want to just go through a big picture history of the universe. Sorry, 380,000 years of CMB. The universe is not 380 billion years old. Do not put that on the record. <laughs> you can tell I did not get a lot of sleep. All right, so just a quick run through. Um, the CMB was emitted at what we call the surface of last scattering at about 380,000 years. I'm going to spend a lot of time today talking about what that is, so I'm going to breeze by it right now. Um, then came a period of something we refer to as the Dark Ages, and that's because the CMB light is emitted. It is traveling, free streaming throughout the universe, but there's nothing in the universe that is producing light at that point. And then, as time goes on, reionization happens. The first stars turn on um, at about 500 million years, and then the universe lights up more like what we are accustomed to today. There are objects in the universe that we can look out with telescopes and see. Um, and then as time goes on, you start to form these kinds of structures that I was showing you, these filamentary structures of, of galaxies with stars and voids. And today, um, at about 13.7 billion years, here's where we are. So how do we know, um, how do we learn about this history? So astrophysical objects, the kinds of things like stars and galaxies and quasars and supernova and all of the objects that we can think about um, are things that you can look at with powerful telescopes of the kind that you can imagine, optical telescopes, infrared telescopes, x-ray telescopes. Um, the cosmic microwave background is particularly interesting because it is the baby picture of the universe before the formation of all of the structure. And that's interesting just because, but it's also particularly interesting because it carries the imprint of the initial conditions of what the universe looked like way back before it got all mixed up by astrophysical processes. And this is really interesting because if you want to ask the question, where did the universe come from in the first place, it is those initial conditions that are particularly interesting. They give you a clue about what generated what we would think of as the Big Bang. Where did the Big Bang come from? What does that mean? Um, and then that gets to the really fundamental question, which is what about before the CMB? What about when the universe, that very, very first second, not the first 380,000 years, but the first 10 to the minus 35 seconds? Where did our four-dimensional space-time come from in the first place? There was a creation event of some kind, what was it? And that is really um, what I think of as the holy grail question and the one that my research group is working on right now. So what is this CMB of which we speak? Um, let's just think a little bit about the history of how we observed what was going on in the universe. So if you think back to the early um, 20th century, in, in the late 1920s, Edwin Hubble observed that the further a galaxy is away from us, the faster it's moving away. And it turned out that that was true no matter which direction. So it, it wasn't just some local effect. And after a lot of careful checking and duplicate measurements and, and making sure that this was indeed what was going on, there the conclusion that was very hard to escape was that the universe is in fact expanding. And this is not what was expected at the time, and it was, it's a strange conclusion. So what does that mean? Well, one thought experiment you can do is if you know that the universe is expanding, and you imagine running time backwards, and you say, if I had the energy density that I can measure out in the universe today, and I imagine running that backwards so that instead of being diffuse and relatively low density per square meter that we have, you, you, you say, let's compress the universe. What does it look like? Well, if you take matter and energy and you compress it and compress it and compress it, it heats up and eventually it reaches a phase of matter that's something like the surface of the sun, something like stellar material something called a plasma. So if you think about that, it's actually a fairly straightforward conclusion that you reach that Ralph, uh, that Alpha and Herman and Gamow predicted was like, okay, well, if that's true, then 
plasmas emit in a way that is not complicated. So it turns out physics is actually pretty simple. And if you have simple systems, it's easy to write down an equation that says what kind of radiation you would expect to see if the state of the universe was described by this kind of matter that we see in our stars and around us. And we know what it does. And we can build it in the lab. And we know what it looks like. And we could, they predicted that if this was true, there should out there be a background of light that conforms to this kind of um, statistical behavior. So, and then you say, okay, well, what would happen? When was it emitted and how does it work? Well, if you keep thinking about working backwards and backwards and backwards, you can think about the state of matter in a star. So if I look at the sun, I see the photons that are emitted at the outside of the sun. I don't see, I can't look inside the sun to see what's going on inside with my eyes. And the reason for that is the matter is very dense, the plasma is very dense, and as soon as light's emitted, it bounces around inside the star, and it gets absorbed and re-emitted and absorbed and re-emitted. And, and then what happens on the surface is the photons are emitted, and then they can travel. So it isn't quite like that with the early universe, because it isn't that there's a localized thing and there's a, a surface. But if you imagine the entire universe having matter that is in a certain state, and then it cools and cools and cools, at some point, neutral hydrogen atoms are able to form. And when that happens, what's called the mean free path of scattering, the, the um, rate at which a photon emitted will crash into an electron to, that will then scatter it and re-emit it, goes way, way, way down because the electrons get bound up in the neutral atoms. So what happens is that the light is able to free stream throughout the universe. And it free streams in all directions. And we call that the surface of last scattering. And this is just a little cartoon that shows, again, I, I use the star as an analogy, but this one uses clouds. Again, if you look at clouds, it's the same thing. You see the surface of a cloud. You don't see inside the cloud for the same reason. Um, and so this is a little cartoon that says, OK, here is when the period of time when the universe was very, very hot and dense, acting like a plasma. It expands, it cools, and then there is a time when the light gets away. And at that time, the universe is still very, very simple. It is matter and radiation mixed up with some dark, ma dark matter and dark energy. But the state of the system is very simple. You don't have a whole lot of astrophysical objects. You have no astrophysical objects to muddy the waters. So if you look at this light, you can see an actual image of what the universe looked like at that time. Um, so that was the theory. Now you have to do an experiment. So the experiment says, well, if the Big Bang model is correct, so this Big Bang model is the idea that the universe starts hot and dense. If this is correct, you should expect to see microwave emission coming from all directions in space, because everywhere the universe is that age. So everywhere you look, you should be able to look far enough away if nothing is between you and the light that was emitted at that time. Anywhere you look, you should be able to see this light. And now this is a bit of a tricky part. The light is emitted when it's a hot plasma, but the whole universe stretches. So space time stretches. And the light is embedded in space time, and it stretches. So the wavelength stretches. Okay. So what you imagine is that it is emitted when it is in the visible infrared region. But by the time we observe it, the universe has expanded a lot, and you would anticipate seeing it in the microwave region of the spectrum. Right? So the wavelengths expand, and you go from waves that are more or less that length to waves that are more or less that length. So you can't get out your Hubble telescope or your Keck telescope or one of these nice tools that we have for the community and go and look for it. You have to build your own telescope to try to go and detect it. So in 1964, Dave Wilkinson and Peter Roll at Princeton, um, Dave Wilkinson was my grand advisor, um, were working on building a telescope to go and search for this light. At the same time, um, the Bell Labs team was working on trying to get their communications antennas to 
function with very low noise. And they had this noise in the antenna, they could not figure out what it was. And the leading theory at the time was that the pigeons were flying around the antennas, they were leaving droppings on the antennas, and they were creating noise in the system. Um, so the folks at Princeton got wind of this and drove down there and said, you have discovered the light from the early universe. And so the, the Bell Labs folks got the Nobel Prize. Um, so this was the first big discovery. Um, there were two companion papers published. One was the discovery paper and one was the exp explanation paper. And things have changed dramatically. You would never see that again, right? If someone discovers something, they are going to put their stake in the ground. <laughs> but having said that, I mean, the, the folks who didn't know what they were looking at are the ones who got the Nobel Prize, so it's sort of interesting. But how do you know for sure that what you're looking at really is the cosmic microwave background. So what they knew, they had a, a narrow range of frequencies, and they knew they had a sense of where it was coming from. But how do you really know for sure that that's what you're looking at? So you want a very strong, very clear prediction of what would you expect to see in this light if you could measure it in more detail than what they were able to do. So this is, this is where um, fundamental physics has a big leg up on a lot of our modern scientific fields. We have very clear observations, theories. Those theories are not fact until not only do they explain what you've already seen, but they're able to predict something you have not yet seen, and then you go out there and you better see what they said you were gonna see or it not right, okay? Very clear-cut rules. Not, you, can't, you don't have those clear-cut rules in a lot of scientific fields, and that muddies a lot, of the, a lot of particularly public communication about what's going on in science. Because if I say, we know the universe is 380,000 years old, people say, yeah, yeah, right. Well, you said that you know, Alzheimer's was caused by X, and that wasn't true. So not, it doesn't work the same way. It's a very, very different um, process. And physics is, is one of those things where um, I'll, I'll give an example in the, in the um, specialist lecture of, of how when, it get, when someone gets it wrong, everybody knows almost instantly, and it's very interesting. But in any case, so the prediction here, the theory was the universe started hot and dense, and it expanded, and if you look back, you should see this light. Wow, there's the light. Okay, now what? What really should the light look like? So if the picture is wrong, then the light could be coming from a, seri a set of sources. It doesn't have to be coming from every single place. Um, and the characteristics of the light, the spectrum, how much light is emitted as a function of the frequency measured, um, could be absolutely anything, right? Depending on what's emitting the light. But if the picture is right, then you should see some very, very specific things. Okay, so what should you see? You should see that because the entire universe evolved the same way, you should see the same thing everywhere. Now, not necessarily the same thing to incredible precision, but something close, right? And you should see a very particular characteristic in the shape. And this shape can be computed very easily. It's a plasma. Plasmas have a black body spectrum. Black body spectrum looks like this. This is the intensity of the light, the brightness, as a function of the frequency or the color. So if you go and look at how, what the intensity is as a function of the color of the light, and you don't see something that looks like this, that model's wrong. Clear cut, we knew this. And then you build an experiment. What else would you know? Well, how does structure form in the universe? Where do we get galaxies and stars and clusters? Well, the idea is that small variations in that primordial plasma little tiny areas that were denser than other regions. Now, I haven't told you yet where those come from, but if you imagine that you'd see structure in the universe, so you know something had to produce it. So here's a model, right? If you start out with tiny variations, a little bit denser here, a little bit less dense there, and you evolve that forward, gravity does, it, does its job. 
Okay, so what happens is the denser regions pull the particles from the less dense regions into the denser regions. The less dense regions have the particles sucked away and you start to form a runaway collapse in, in what we call gravitational wells. And if enough matter starts to fall into those gravitational wells, you also know what happens. It starts to heat up, the pressure builds, and if it gets high enough, there's enough pressure to ignite nuclear burning and you, you turn on stars. So this is a very, very simple model. You have little variations that come from somewhere, we'll talk about where. If you, can, if you have those, wow, everything else makes sense. So if that model is right, if you don't know what the model is, you don't know what you should see in the CMB, but if the picture is right, again, very specific thing. You should see tiny variations in the light that you measure, tiny spatial variations that have the same statistical properties evolved, but from what we see in our galaxies and clusters today. So you know what you're looking for. And this is kind of a bold suggestion. You know, if, if this is wrong, you won't see anything like this. You could see anything. If it's right, you know exactly what you're looking for. So the Cosmic Background Explorer, or COBE, um, flew in 1990, and here's what they saw. So here is, this is data and theory with error bars, and the data is so good, and it's such a clear fit to the theory that you can't even see the error bars on that data. Um, this is an unbelievable confirmation that this bang, Big Bang model is, is right, okay? There's just no question. The universe started out or went through a period of time that was a hot plasma. There's no question about that. Well, what else? They also saw these variations. These are the seeds of structural formation, that this is it. This is the first look at, at where all of the structure in the universe came from. So that was the second Nobel Prize given in 2006 for the, the measurement of that black body and the identification of the fluctuations. But there's a lot more than that. So what else can we learn by studying these patterns in the microwave background? You can learn how old the universe is. You can learn a lot about what kind of conditions were around in the early universe. You can learn about the constituents of the universe. What is it made out of? How much dark energy? How much dark matter? How much ordinary matter that makes up all the stuff that we can see and touch? What is the geometry? Um, and some thoughts, some hints about how it will evolve in the future. So just an example. So the geometry happens to be one of those parameters that is particularly easy to pull out because you can understand, if you look at, depending on how the universe is curved or not curved, the patterns should look different. And this sounds wishy-washy, and in the specialist lecture, I'll talk about how we get to those patterns, how you predict that. But this is what I did for my PhD thesis. We looked at, um, we had just gotten to the point where we could measure far enough that we could start to pull out the geometry, and what we discovered was that this is the right model. The, ge the geometry of the universe is flat. It is not curved in this way or curved in that way. Um, that's just one little tip of the iceberg thing you can pull out from looking at the simple patterns. So a few things we've learned up to this point. Um, the universe is expanding, and that expansion is accelerating. So that's another interesting idea. So not only is the universe getting bigger, but the rate at which it's getting bigger is speeding up. Weird. Um, it's particularly weird because if the constituents of the universe are just ordinary matter and energy of the type that we are familiar with, you would not get this. You need an extra ingredient to get this acceleration. And, and what, if we have time, we can talk about what ingredients that might be. Um, but we refer to that ingredient as dark energy. And that, that's a, a bit of a place marker kind of name because we really don't know what it is. But we do know 
that of the makeup of the energy density in the universe, atoms, atoms are the kind of matter, the only kind of matter we can make sense of. Everything you touch is made up of atoms. That's only 4.6% of the energy density in the universe. Another quarter is dark matter. We don't know what that is. We think it's just a kind of particle. We think it's a kind of particle that doesn't interact with light or doesn't interact very well with light, unlike all of our atomic particles that interact through electromagnetic interactions. So probably it's just a particle and probably we'll find that particle. It's just hard to find it because all the stuff we touch interacts with through inter electromagnetic interactions. But this stuff's really weird, right? What's that? Um, there are theories about what that is. Um, but we don't know, and, and that's what we're trying to find out. The other thing that's particularly interesting to me is that the conditions of the very, very early universe are also characteristic of an accelerated expansion. So in some ways, our current dynamical state is similar to the dynamical state of the universe when it was less than a second old. That's kind of interesting too, and we don't really know how that's connected, so we're trying to figure that out. We also know, we've now measured that the geometrical flatness is true to less than a percent. It is about 13.8 billion years old to pretty astonishing accuracy, and, and this, is, this is the makeup. So a coherent story starts to take place. So we have a tiny baby universe that is born in the form of a plasma. Quantum mechanical fluctuations in that plasma form the seeds for structure formation. The universe starts to expand, and when you expand to macroscopic scales, those quantum mechanical fluctuations are placed into macroscopic scales, providing the seeds for structure formation, and then you get this cooling, and then those seeds produce the structure that you see today, and that's the whole story, more or less, okay? The piece that I realized as I was saying the summary that I didn't zoom in on, that I want to zoom in on just for a second, is I told you that when we looked at the microwave background fluctuations, the statistics match the statistics of the clustering of galaxies. What I didn't point out yet, and I want to do that, is that it also, those statistics, are the statistics that are characteristic of quantum mechanical fluctuations on microscopic scales. This makes no sense if the universe was always macroscopic. But if you imagine a universe starting in the microscopic state, governed by quantum mechanical fluctuations, and expanding the, that same universe to macroscopic size, then it makes perfect sense. Because how else are you going to get all these seeds? Well, there you go. There's a model. So the question is, well, how do you do that? And, and we'll talk a little bit about where I think that comes from. But there are a couple other things I want to highlight first. So this coherent picture starts to take shape. It starts to make sense. And if you're not really paying super close attention, you might say, OK, we've got it nailed. But it has some weird features. So why is it geometrically flat? We know that it is, but why is that true? And why is it so uniform? So it turns out that we thought, you know, more as you look out at the CMB in all directions, it should be more or less the same. But it turns out it's, one part, it's the same to one part in 100,000. Turns out that's actually kind of hard to produce. Because you don't expect, if you just take the size of our observable universe now, and you imagine, you measure how fast it's expanding, which you can do, and then you run it backwards and you say, okay, well, how big would it have been back then? The light, the areas that are over there now and over there now should never have been in causal contact with each other before. Well, that's a problem because if they're not in causal contact, causal contact means that information can travel from that part of the universe to that part of the universe. They can't, can't do that now because it's taken the whole history of the universe to get to us from over there and the whole history of the universe to get to us from over there. So these two parts of the universe are not talking to each other. 
but they have to have been talking to each other at some point to have come into thermal equilibrium so that they could be the same temperature to one part in 100,000. So something's weird if you think about a normal expansion history. The flatness is also weird, right? So it turns out that there are three possible cases for the geometry, right? You can have normal Euclidean geometry, by which I mean, if I send two parallel lines out into the universe, they stay parallel forever. I can have the kind of curved geometry that exists on the surface of the Earth. If I send two lines out, they're gonna curve around. Or I can have the opposite, right? It's more like a saddle kind of geometry. It can take any number you want, but only certain values result in a habitable universe. So if this parameter we refer to as omega, which is a ratio of the gravitational potential energy to the kinetic expansion, you don't have to worry about that. It's a measure of flatness. Okay? But if that parameter is too small, then galaxies can't form. But if the parameter is too big, then the universe is younger than the Earth. And that's not okay either. But what makes it even weirder is that it's really strange that the number just happens to be one, i.e. flat, to pretty exquisite precision, precision, less than a percent, because that actually turns out that one is an unstable point. So however much curvature you have at the beginning, as you expand in a normal expansion, that curvature should get magnified. So if you start out with a tiny little bit, then you end up with a huge amount. And so you have what's, what was referred to as a fine tuning problem. So in order to get really, really flat, it needs to be so exquisitely, unbelievably, crazily flat to begin with. Why? That's a weird set of conditions. Okay. And then on top of that, you have the horizon problem that I started talking about a minute ago. The uniformity is weird. You would not expect that. You would not expect one part in 100,000, the light to be the same from every direction. Um, which suggests that the universe all over must at some point have been in contact. Our entire observable universe must at some point in the distant past have been in causal contact. So how do you get that? So there's this crazy idea, so there's a theoretical explanation that does remarkably well. Okay, so there's something called inflation. And the idea here is that our four-dimensional world is created from something. Where exactly it's created is a very, very active area of research in string theory and M-theory, et cetera, but we don't know the answer. But the idea is the universe starts out tiny with microscopic fluctuations, and then the entire universe undergoes a superluminal expansion. Okay, now this should make your head spin because you know that light cannot, nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. But I'm telling you the universe expanded faster than the speed of light. The trick here is that nothing is traveling faster than the speed of light. So what Einstein's relativity says is that nothing embedded in the fabric of space-time can travel more quickly than the speed of light. But it doesn't say anything about how rapidly the fabric of space-time itself can expand. And that's what this is talking about. So if you're talking about anything within that fabric, it, nothing in that fabric is moving faster than it's allowed to move. So the theory is OK in terms of math mathematical. You're not breaking the, the rules that we have laid down. It's weird, but it's OK. Um, and then the idea is that when that happens, quantum mechanical fluctuations are stretched with the rest of the universe to cosmic scales that then create those seeds. So then those fluctuations become the seeds and you get the structure, et cetera. So let's think about how it solves those two problems. So if you think about the size, so this up here is the size of the universe. So bigger is that way. And up here is time. So we always think about what's happening as you go backwards in time. So we imagine the universe getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And a normal model, so this would be if it just expanded under normal conditions, the smallest that it would ever be is here. And that's where it doesn't work. 
But inflation does this crazy thing, right? It goes through this period of time when the universe is somewhere between 10 to the minus 45, 10 to the minus 35 seconds, i.e. much, 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 much than less than a second old. All of a sudden, it expands a huge amount. So the radius of the observable universe gets much bigger by many, many orders of magnitude, right? 50 orders of magnitude. If that happens, all of a sudden, the horizon problem goes away, right? Because now, this, your entire observable universe could have lived within a very, very small piece of the whole universe. And there's no problem with thermal equilibrium. And the flatness problem goes away also. Because the idea is you're no longer taking a normal expansion history and saying a little bit of flatness is magnified. You're saying, no, no, no. What you're looking at is just such a tiny, tiny piece of the whole universe that any initial condition is OK, because it doesn't matter what the curvature is. If you, are, if you take any little tiny piece, you could have all kinds of curvature. But you're only looking at such a little tiny piece of it that your local piece, when it gets blown up to giant scale, will appear as though it's very, very flat. So it drives the measured flatness of our universe to the flatness that we expect and the flatness that we observe. So that's sort of cool, right? You have a theory that actually that gives you an explanation for what it is that we see. It's consistent with the cosmological uh, measurements, and it nicely explains a number of perplexing features. But it's just a theory until it predicts something that hasn't yet been seen, and that thing then gets seen, right? So just like inflation, sorry, just like the cosmic microwave background, it better tell you what you got to go out there and look for. And it turns out it does. So inflation predicts that during that very, very, very tiny fraction of a second, when the universe is undergoing this crazy expansion, it's producing something called gravitational waves. And these gravitational waves leave an imprint on the cosmic microwave background. So this is the holy grail, right? If we can see the imprint of this time on this time, then we can get a sense of what was going on way, way, way back, right? So this also provides a window into the physics of the universe, a thousand trillion times higher energy than is possible with any particle accelerator that we can imagine building in any of our lifetimes. So you're talking about not only, you know, that the certain guys like to say that you know they're building an early universe machine, not anywhere close to this early universe right? can they can they study. So, so what is a gravitational wave? Um, funny you should ask. February 19th, early this month, um, actually maybe it was the week before that, I can't remember, the last, last couple of weeks, the LIGO team announced the first observation of a gravitational wave. This is classy science. <laughs> these guys did it right. They didn't, all of these, um, headlines were from a press conference that was called after the paper had been sent to a peer-reviewed journal and after everybody in the peer-reviewed community had a chance to say yes indeed this is what they saw and then they made their public announcement. This stands in contrast to what I've seen other places and it's not good, this is good. right? And it's an unbelievably beautiful measurement. So, so I just thought we'd talk about this for a second. So how much, what time should I be targeting? It's almost 2.30. Um, yeah, somewhere, maybe another five minutes. Okay. So if you think about the way that relativity works, so we started out with Newtonian physics that says objects attract each other at a distance. And Einstein came along and said, yeah, well, here's why. That's right. Newtonian physics is right. We're not saying it's wrong, but here's why. Why is because massive objects bend the fabric of space-time and create wells into which other massive objects fall or circle around. So what LIGO did was look at the most extreme version of what happens when you bend space-time because it turns out this is a tiny, 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 tiny signal that can be produced, so they need to find crazy extreme events. So what they saw 
was here's a, a simulation of what you would see with your eyes if you saw two black holes. This is actual, actual real numerical simulation. This is not an artist's concept. But this is what you would see if you were close enough to two giant black holes, something like 30 times the mass of our sun, each one, and you saw them circling around each other about to collide. So this is, this is what you would actually see happen. And if you look at that in the bending of space-time, here's what you would see. Okay, so this is, this is looking at what, what the space-time fabric looks like as these black holes come to each other. And what you can see is that each one of them has their own, has bent space-time a whole bunch, right? And as they get close, can you see this track there? Okay, so this, this is the gravitational waves that are being produced as these guys circle around. Gravitational waves are like ripples in a pond. Okay, you drop in a pebble into a pond and you get these waves in the surface of the water. It's like that in the fabric of space-time. So certain kinds of distortions in the fabric of space-time will create waves in space-time that travel outward. Oh, it pauses there for some reason to make it go. All right, so, so basically what, what you're going to see is the black holes collide, you see a big spike in the shape, and then you see this ring down. And so what I wanted to play for you is it turns out that what, this, what it does, the gravitational wave then propagates through space-time, and when it passes Earth, it, does, it basically squishes and expands and squishes and expands space time and, and, and everything it touches. So the Earth itself squishes and expands and squishes and expands. And it's doing it so, so little, right? A tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of the width of a proton. So it's a really, really, really difficult thing to measure, even for these enormous violent events, like two black holes, each of which are 30 solar masses, colliding into each other. The amount of energy produced in that collision is equivalent to taking three suns and vaporizing them in less than half a second. I mean, unbelievable amount of energy from a billion light years away. And yet, it produces a tiny, tiny distortion. Thank you very much. Um, let's see if we can get to... I'm going to skip over that one because I don't want to run into that again, um, especially since we have very little time. Um, <clears throat> But the distortion is, is so, so, so tiny that you need really sensitive instrumentation to try to detect it. So the LIGO team, led by Ray Weiss at MIT, who's just a remarkable man, he's been working on this for 40 years. And the team has been working on this particular experiment for 25 years. And they put together this crazy experiment where you have two very big interferometers sitting in vacuum tubes that are enormous. Here's, here's what they would look like imposed on Manhattan. That's not where they are. Um, and you have a mirror, and they're measuring the, different, the change in the difference in the length of these cavities as the gravitational wave goes through. And there are two of them, so they measure it in two coincident locations. And this, I'm going to pull this off. Actually, I'm going to pause it first, tell you what you're hearing. So this is the actual thing they observed. So the first thing they observed was not some little three sigma event. It was this beautiful, stunning thing. So what you're going to see, it, it, plays, it plays repeatedly. So it plays twice at the frequency that actually, if you just simply converted the gravitational waves to audio, what you would hear, and then it plays it again, changing the frequency a little so it's easier to hear. But so you're going to hear the event again and again. So what you're hearing is this peak of when it collides and it rings down. And, and you can see um, this is the data that they measured and this is the sound chirp. So I'll just play it for you. I'm going to take this off. Oops. Let's see. A little chirp. That's the collision. Chirp. There it is. Um, 
really cool. But what's even cooler than that is that gravitational waves have a spectrum just like light. And it's a whole new window that's now just been opened up on the universe. It's like we have had eyes and we just got ears and now we can hear. And one of the things that we should be able to hear someday, not anytime soon, is the sound of the Big Bang. But we have a shortcut, right? We are not waiting to hear that sound by seeing how much it moves Earth, because that's really, really, really hard. It's many, 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 many orders of magnitude less than colliding black holes in terms of the amplitude. We have a shortcut. So the shortcut is, going back to the early universe, that these gravitational waves pass by the cosmic microwave background and they leave imprints in the cosmic microwave background. And it's those imprints that we are trying to measure. And the idea here is that the distortions in the background of the fabric of space-time that the gravitational waves produce are observable by polarization signatures. So it changes the polarization of the light just a little bit and you should be able to see little tiny changes in polarization in the microwave background. So that is what we're looking for. And there are other things that create polarization. And in the specialist lecture, I'll talk a little bit about how you might separate them. But they have different signatures. So the ordinary temperature fluctuations that we've already measured have signatures that look kind of like this. And the gravitational waves have signatures that look kind of like that. And that's what we're going after measuring. So that is what we refer to as the Holy Grail. And I was going to spend a little time talking about the experimental side of it, but I will leave that to the specialist lecture and, and stop there and take questions.